I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from Ukraine, analyse further the collaboration and training by the CIA to Ukraine security services, and I interview Ukrainian activists who work with children from the liberated territories. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 25th of October, 2023, one year and 243 days since the full-scale invasion began. And joining me today are Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Foreign Reporter Maidna Nanu, and Senior Technology Reporter Gareth Caulfield. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from the battlefront. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. So first up, Russia appears to be increasingly supplementing the use of Shahid 131-136 drones with a new cheaper and lighter domestically produced drone variant used mainly at the moment in their ongoing attacks against Ukrainian infrastructure. So this is according to the ISW, Institute for the Study of War. But also Russian media have been speculating this week. On Monday, they were talking about Russian forces using a new long-range Italmas drone and variants used for the first time Monday over Kyiv Oblast. They say Italmas drones are lighter than the Shahids and therefore sort of harder to detect and shoot down. Russian mill bloggers say the drones are cheaper so they could be more widely manufactured, but that they obviously deliver a slightly lighter payload, which restricts their usefulness in isolation. So it's, th- it's thought likely that Russia are using these new drones in tandem with Shahids to confuse and use up use up the air defense so some, something will get through now isw are saying they previously assessed that russia is trying to expand diversify its arsenal of drones missiles guided bombs all the, all the rest of it particularly in advance of winter and it's thought that these new drones these are talmas drones are all, already part of that um, that wider munitions diversification effort now into the into ukraine itself and ukrainian forces have continued their offensive operations in the east and the south over the last 24 hours first in the east where russia is still very heavily committed to the fight for abdivka so this is 10 k's southwest ish of bakhmut although that fight has come at a very very high cost for russia in terms of personnel and armored vehicles lost geolocated footage from monday shows ukrainian forces advance slightly to the east of avdivka now they hold the center of the of the city there of the town there russia is trying to outflank in the north and the south so it's not clear if that report of an advance or those the geolocation of those movements there is is from the center and further east or if they've managed to push back either of those two russian prongs i think it's probably probably the former to be perfectly honest now ukrainian forces also thought to advance very slightly to the south of bakhmut they've uh, so that's obviously slightly further north and avdivka but there's a huge fight going on in the east at the moment more geolocated footage from yesterday shows that ukraine mar- marginally advanced to south of bakhmut and also down in the southwest in robotina marginally to the west there as well so that's the salient that, that ukraine had been trying to force in the south in zaporizhia oblast um, now those actions in the east and the south were also reported by the ukrainian general staff Uh, Next, Russian authorities are intensifying their mobilisation efforts, targeting Central Asian migrant communities in Russia. So the Russian Internal Affairs Minister, Vladimir Kolkoltsev, said, uh, well, he's been talking about um, migration problems and ethnic crime, as he calls it, um, and has insinuated that migrants commit a a much higher rate of crime than natural-born Russian citizens. This is all obviously in the context of recent Russian law enforcement mobilisation raids on migrant communities, which Kolokotsev has defended. And he says that Russian law enforcement is um, is just sticking up for standard legal norms. Now, of course... This is all likely to be another strand in Moscow's mobilisation by stealth tactic so as not to risk the anger that, that briefly boiled up last year when they, when they announced their first um, what they call partial mobilisation. A Russian insider source said that the Russian investigative committee is conducting uh, investigations into naturalised migrants with Russian citizenship 
and is reopening previously terminated and cancelled criminal cases in order to mobilise migrants to fight in uh, Ukraine. This insider claimed that the Russian investigative committee is going to look at migrants for committing any offence, even minor ones, and will expand that individual's investigation to include their friends and family. So, you know, keep an eye on that more. Mobilisation by stealth going on there. Next, referring to the recent raids, um, whatever we're going to call them, across the Dnipro River in the south, Britain's MOD um, today acknowledging that fighting there has intensified around the banks of the lower reaches of the Dnipro over the last week. They say Ukraine has given a much higher priority to operations in that sector than they had done uh, for some time. Um, building up the small bridgeheads on the east bank, it, now in their words, those that it has controlled since the summer. Now, when they say control, I'm not sure if they mean they have. A, there's been a physical presence there um, since the summer, or that Ukraine, having uh, with the, as the Russians left Hezon and got across the river, whether or not they just refer to Ukraine's ability to bring accurate fire down onto the area from positions on the west bank. But clearly, there's still something going on down there in the bottom end of the of the Dnipro. British defence intelligence say Russia has likely been alert to the possibility of attacks across the river since um, since it withdrew from that western bank, um, or since Russia withdrew from the western bank about 12 months ago, and say that that area, the Russian side, is is under the control of a newly established 18th Combined Arms Army after some of the units that have previously been in the area were diverted further east um, to the main area of that of that Ukrainian sort of push down into um, into that salient that they've been trying to. Build. Build. Now, fine, 18th Combined Arms Army, big old unit on paper, big formation on paper, whether or not it is the, the full strength you'd expect from a CAA and whether or not it's got any kind of experience at all and equipment and what have you, if it's well led and all that sort of stuff, we don't know. However, British Defence Intelligence also notes that, that the decisive factor in that fight is almost certainly both sides' ability to bring accurate and intense artillery fire to bear and they say that the initial their initial indication... Uh, this week suggests Russia has maintained a significant artillery capability within range of the river. That might be as a result we saw two weeks ago now, the um, supplies from North Korea, which we think were very artillery ammunition heavy, those supplies that we we think um, uh, Russia has got from North Korea. Uh, A couple more. Defence Minister, Russia's Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu, he's been out and about, visited Ukraine, inspecting a command post, meeting senior officers. This comes from the Russian MOD. They put a statement out earlier on today. We see a nice video of him flying in a, in a helicopter, but no idea when that was filmed. But we're told he was in eastern Ukraine to hear a, a report on the situation on the front line. I'm sure that's absolutely up to date and accurate. Also hear about the training of drone operators and on preparations for fighting in winter conditions. Yeah. OK, if it's anything like last winter, their, their preparations will probably be have another couple of gloves between the team, boys. And then finally, Steve Rosenberg, BBC's Russia correspondent, he posted a video yesterday to mark... 20 months since the start of the full-scale invasion. He was going through Moscow papers again, as he, as he does quite routinely. He's fluent in Russian, so he's, you know, he's a great source on this stuff. And he says the war is getting scant mention, very few articles on it, possibly as a Kremlin strategy to normalise the war as something that's just, just happening in the background. There's no dramas, nothing to see here. We're all over it, all under control. He's suggesting this is... so that people lose interest don't pay attention to the fact that what they're promised has not happened and in so doing calm the domestic political arena ahead of presidential elections next year which are usually a sham anyway but they really don't want any kind of upset during that so keep an eye on um, I mean he's a really good guy really good source follow him on Twitter keep an eye on him on the news Um, he's very good when he goes through the paper and just finally finally I know I said finally but I've always got two finallys I just note today the Russian parliament has approved that bill that we spoke about last week the bill to withdraw from the nuclear test ban treaty so now both houses of the Russian parliament have unanimously approved the bill to withdraw Russia from the nuclear test ban treaty and that now goes to Putin for final approval we had a good chat last week with them with the double IWS about this, so do do have a look back about the current state of play regarding missiles and nuclear treaties and what have you. We need to need to do another deep dive on that, but uh, I'll take a little pause there for now, David. Thank you very much, Dom, for all of that. Well, Maidna, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Thank you so much uh, for making time and joining us. There's a fair few stories to talk through, I think, in the diplomatic and political spheres. Let's start with diplomatic relations between Germany and Ukraine. Maidna Nani. 
Yes. Yeah, so um, yesterday, Olaf Scholz was speaking at a German-Ukrainian business forum in Berlin, and he has pledged to maintain aid to Ukraine. Uh, and this is kind of an attempt to reassure Ukraine that it will continue to have German backing economically, financially, and humanitarian aid, and of course, with weapons. And this is in the face of uh, the world appearing to turn its attention to what's happening in in Israel and uh, Gaza. And just Prime Minister Dennis Shmihal said he expects Germany to provide Ukraine with an additional 1.4 billion euros to enhance its air defences. And that's just to help it get through a second winter at war with Russia. So that's one to watch in terms of continued support for Ukraine as things elsewhere in the world continue. And just um, moving away from Germany and and Ukraine, let's talk a little bit about reliance on Russian hydrocarbons. I mean, it was a huge goal of the Russian state, I think, at the beginning of the war and sort of moving through the last few months. But there's been an interesting update uh, from the European Union. Uh, Maidna, can you talk us through that? Yeah, so yesterday the EU said it was on track towards its goal of ending Europe's reliance on Russian fossil fuels within this decade. And you'll remember last winter, there was um, a big scarcity of uh, Russian gas and a massive increase in energy prices. Uh, But a report yesterday from Brussels found that the EU expects imports of Russian gas to drop to 40 to 45 billion cubic metres this year, compared with 155 Um, billion cubic metres in 2021, which is the year obviously before the war began. And they said that the worst effects of this crisis may now be behind us. But they did say that, you know, of course, there's no room for complacency. So I suppose we'll see what happens this winter in terms of energy prices and everything. Um, But that appears to be some good news. Yeah, that's a fascinating update from the EU. I'm sure we'll uh, bring some of our economic correspondents to talk about this in more detail, I think, in the future. Just a a a final update from you, Maidener. Um, Let's go back to Britain. Uh, There's been a bit of a warning from the British Labour Party. That's the uh, the opposition party here in the UK. Yeah, so um, John Healy, who, as you'll know, is the Shadow Defence Secretary, yesterday warned that Britain's leadership in supporting Ukraine is flagging. And he has called on the government to maintain its focus on supporting Ukraine, even as international attention is turning to what's happening in the Middle East. And he, you know, he did, to be fair, and praised so far the UK's leadership on Ukraine. But he said he fears that the UK momentum is flagging. And as almost evidence, he pointed out that there hasn't been a Ukraine statement to Parliament from Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, since his appointment. And he said... No, there hasn't been any statement from any defence secretary since May. And just for fairness, James Heapy, a, who's the minister for, um, a minister for defence, insisted that the UK is committed to supporting both Israel and Ukraine and that Britain won't lose focus on Ukraine despite the situation. And he said it's important that Vladimir Putin knows that our resolve is to support both countries. Any final updates from you made now? I know that there was another statement out of Italy as well. So Giorgio Maloney, who's of course the Italian Prime Minister, also just adding to that warning that the world shouldn't forget about what's happening in Ukraine. She said that Europe must not weaken its common support as it also offers solidarity to Israel. And he said, she said that we must not make the mistake of weakening our common support to Ukraine. And she said that ahead of a meeting of European Union leaders. Well, thank you very much, Maidna. That's the meeting I think that's coming up tomorrow that we'll have uh, Joe Barnes, our Brussels correspondent, calling in from. Well, thank you very much, Maidna. For people who don't know, Maidna is running the Ukraine live blog today, tomorrow and Friday. So do go there for the latest news. Maidna, thank you so much for your time. Let's move then to Gareth Caulfield. Gareth, thank you thank you so much for joining us. We haven't had you on the podcast for a while. I know there's sort of bits and pieces of updates, including a, a story on the internet in Moldova, but we've mainly brought you on to talk about, just get your reaction to the, the very much in-depth WSJ piece on the uh, collaboration between the CIA and Ukrainian security services. Where would you like to start, Gareth Caulfield? Thank you very much indeed, David. Yes, it's great to be back on again and to uh, talk about a topic which I I always enjoy talking about, which is espionage and all the interesting activities that spooks of the world get up to. Uh, Now, regular listeners will have already heard the the pod discussing this one. I think Francis was talking about it earlier this week. This is an extended long read piece in the Washington Post headlined, Ukrainian spies with deep ties to CIA wage shadow war against Russia. 
Now, this is a, it's a piece of journalistic art. I doff my cap to the authors. It's, it's very good. Great in-depth reporting. I strongly recommend you, you go and read it. My reaction to this is... It's interesting. It's, it's interesting in that it shows that it, it lifts the lid, if you will, on the, the shadow war that these the sort of, for British listeners, a sort of SOE style infiltration on the hostile territory and the ability to strike the enemy in his backyard, which the Ukrainian security services are now carrying out. So SOE is the um, Special Operations Executive, which is one of the... Um, World War Two era uh, British agencies that parachuted agents into occupied France and, and other countries. This is, I think, a really, really good insight into what's going on there. I mean, it's been, the piece talks about elite teams of Ukrainian operatives being trained and equipped, and I quote here, in close partnership with the CIA, uh, according to current and former Ukrainian and US officials, unquote. Now, that's quite telling because it's, you know, obviously, you know, CIA clandestine operations are not something that tends to get uh, reported in great depth or detail or broadcast any particular, with any particular focus on them. So having this on the record from officials, having that, that sort of, you know, lots of people saying, yes, this is going on, there is direct close training cooperation between the US agencies and the, the Ukrainian counterparts, with the intention of the Ukrainians going forth and using that knowledge to continue the, uh, their country's ability to fight back against Russia, that's really good. That shows that there is still a, a good, solid groundswell of support in the West for the Ukrainian cause. I mean, we just had Megan there talking about you know, the, the potential for the, for the perception of weakening support, certainly from the UK. But this piece shows us that you know, whatever dithering may or may not be happening over outside the Atlantic, the US remains standing firm in its commitment to help the Ukrainians, not only with the big ticket items that we've heard about in, in great depth over the last couple of years, you know, the, the missiles, the warplanes, the you know, bombs, guns and armaments, but also in the small, low level operations that can still have a really massive effect on their own. Um, now, it's, it's worth noting here that US intelligence officials have stressed to the Washington Post that they have had no direct involvement themselves in targeted killing operations. This is certainly not an instance where we've, we've got undercover Americans going out and bumping off Russian officials or senior military officers. That's not the case. It's not what is reported to be happening here. It is very much CIA training saying, right, if you guys are going to go out and conduct covert operations, this is how you do it. These are the best methods. These are the tactics, techniques and procedures you should be employing. And that's very much what we've got here reported in detail. So David, in, in conclusion on this one, I would say it's a really good insight. It shows that the commitment is still there. And above all, it shows that Ukraine is far from a busted flush. They're still going strong with good, solid Western support, and they're still achieving good direct operation, operational effect, to use the military phrase. Thank you very much for that summary, Gareth. Just a few questions from me. Were there any details in the report that you, uh, you thought were particularly surprising or, 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 or that you didn't expect? And what did you make of the the obvious disagreements between the parties over some of the Ukrainian operations? Those, yeah, the disagreements, I think, were quite good, actually. That's, again, that's a sort of level of detail that we rarely see in the public sphere. And it's good to see that there's that sort of reporting is that in-depth that we actually see and, and hear about the fact that the, the, the CIA trainers and the Ukrainian counterparts are disagreeing about what to target, who to target, how to target them, indeed. I mean, and I don't, I'm going to speak about a, a, an incident that was reported this week, which is not connected with this Washington Post story. But there was a, a little news snippet doing the rounds of a Ukrainian, or allegedly a Ukrainian operative, turning up to, of all things, it was the, <laughs> the anniversary celebration of a Russian fighter squadron, and a Russian Air Force unit. Uh, and he is said to have turned up with a poisoned bottle of whiskey and a poisoned cake, uh, and encouraged all these Russian fighter pilots to partake of these poisoned goods. Now, while that's not referred to in this Washington Post story, it's very easy to imagine that that's the kind of thing where Western trainers might say, oh, 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 hang on a minute, you can't just randomly poison large numbers of, of enemy personnel. You know, We come from a background in the West where typically we're looking at taking out targeted senior people, top commanders, influential politicians, perhaps that sort of thing. When we do carry out these kinds of operations, I'm told it tends to be in a very focused and limited way, certainly from the UK point of view. Whereas from the Ukrainian side, you can imagine you're in a war of national survival. Does it really matter if you have bumped off, let's say, the, the cooks or the aircraft mechanics rather than the pilots themselves who are 
delivering munitions onto the homes of your loved ones and, and your, you know, your friends and family and so on. Perhaps for the Ukrainians, they see less of a distinction than we have the luxury of seeing here in the West. But that, I think, you know, that, that sort of disagreement, that sort of tensions between the trainers and the trainees and what the trainees are going out and doing, it's revealing, it's insightful. It shows that there is still a, a gap in the mindsets between Ukraine and their Western supporters at this stage, David. Thank you very much, Gareth. Let's move on then. Dom and Gareth, any final thoughts, please? Let's go to Dom Nichols first. Sure. Well, I've been looking at I've been trying to find, find more information on it, but I note that US Ambassador to Kazakhstan, Dan, Daniel Rosenblum, he's uh, inaugurated a new, uh, uh, well, a NATO liaison office in Kazakhstan's capital, which is unusual and interesting. After Russia, Kazakhstan is the biggest supplier of, of troops to the CSCO, Collective Security Treaty Organization, the organization the security group Russia would, would like to. It, us to think it was kind of NATO's equivalent. It's nothing of the scale or scope, and it's largely a a way for Russia to do whatever it likes under a fig leaf of kind of international, all, all playing nicely. Um, however, it's worth noting that between 2013 to 17, NATO did have a liaison officer for Central Asia based out of Uzbekistan. So it's not completely unprecedented, but that office was closed in 2016 for budgetary reasons. Secretary General um, cancelled that and that, that finished on 2017. So not completely unusual. And Kazakhstan is a member of NATO's Partnership for Peace programme, which is a, you know, a way of reaching out and having a relationship with those countries that don't have full membership or on a path to membership. But it is still quite striking. If you think about what's happened in, in Kazakhstan in the last few months and this sort of slight distancing or certainly a cooling with relations with, um, with Moscow, I think this is, this is quite significant. We need to get uh, James Kilner back on to tell us exactly what it means. And I'm trying to find more information. There's interestingly nothing on NATO's, NATO's website about it directly. So I wonder if, they were just, if it was just a, trying not to make a big deal of it, but they, they've, they've not, uh, not managed that. So I'm keeping an eye on Kazakhstan, but I think that, that relationship Relationship, that developing slash worsening relationship between Kazakhstan and Russia is very interesting and one to watch. Thank you very much, Dom. Gareth Caulfield. Thanks, David. Yes, there's a, an interesting little little row brewing up in Moldova, which, as, as this is known, is a, is a rather small ex-Soviet state, sort of tucked away between Ukraine and the Black Sea, down in the corner, as it were, or the western corner of the Black Sea. The Moldovans this week have blocked access, or they're one of their state agencies has ordered the blocking of access to more than 20 Russian media websites after saying they were used as part of an information war against the country. So Moldova's intelligence and security service has decreed that uh, these, these 22 Russian news services, including household names such as Russia Today and you know, NTV, it's also one called Pervy Canal. I would like to reassure listeners that Pervy Canal is actually a direct translation of uh, Channel One, or the Russian equivalent of BBC One. But the blocking of these is, is part of the context of Moldova being caught up almost, but not quite, in the Ukrainian war. There's been reports over the past sort of year or two now of Russian doings, Russian goings-on, things that have made the Ukrainian, yeah, correction, the Moldovan authorities a bit nervous, a bit concerned that perhaps there's going to be a sort of an escalation against them as Russia seeks extra leverage against Ukraine. So the blocking of this, I think, is, is part of a sort of a, a very visible stand-up stance to say, hey, no, we don't like Russia, we are not on board in any of this. Uh, and that has actually angered Moscow. So um, a Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova has said blocking of these Russian news websites uh, shows that the <laughs> Moldovans have a Russophobic attitude. And I quote from her statement today, she says, The medium-term goal of such a policy is to eliminate Russian language content and mass media from the information space of Moldova. So these, these 20 odd websites, the blocking of them is supposed to have been immediate. Reuters reporter in Chisinau, which is the Moldovan capital, reports that he was able to access some of them earlier today. So we don't know quite what's going on there, whether it's just a case of the internet blocking being a bit slower than perhaps the Moldovan authorities intended. Just on a, on a slight technical note here, blocking a website from accessing a country, it's a fairly straightforward process. You from the authorities' point of view, you tell an internet service provider, so for, for British listeners, that would be the likes of BT or Virgin Media or whoever, you tell the ISP, block these websites, you know, we have the lawful power to do this, we want you to disable normal access to that. And what then happens is the ISP goes away, makes some tweaks on a computer server somewhere, and stops serving traffic or serving traffic requests to and from that website. So, so people who are subscribers to the ISP can't view it. 
It's not to say that that is a completely watertight or perfect method of blocking uh, web access. Uh, there are, of course, you know, browsers such as Tor, the Onion Router, which are specifically designed to get around that sort of content blocking. But for the vast majority of people, you know, the, the 90% of non-tech head nerds like me out there, these, these sort of blocks are, are good enough. You, you type in RT in, in the UK. If you type in RT.com into your web browser on most UK, UK ISPs now, you just simply can't get to it because it's been blocked by the decree of our authorities here. So, you know, in a way, you can say that the Moldovans are sort of taking their lead from the West, from countries such as Britain, and have said, right, we don't want more of this Russian propaganda, Russian language, very distorted view of what's going on in Ukraine and, you know, the Russian view on that and the, well, I'm sure we discuss at great depth all the, all the rights and wrongs as the Russians see it of their invasion of Ukraine. So, yeah, the, the Russian authorities are, are pretty hacked off about it, but in summary, there's not much they can do. And I think it's it may cause some domestic ructions in Moldova. I mean, obviously, as, a, as an ex-Soviet republic, there is a, a long tradition there of people speaking the Russian language, although the only official language, according to Reuters, is actually Romanian in Moldova. Nonetheless, a large chunk of the population still speak the Russian language there. So whether that causes domestic disquiet or whether the, the people of Moldova are content to, to get on with life as it is, it remains to be seen for now, David. But thank you for that. Thank you, Dom, Maidner and Gareth. Earlier today, I spoke to Dmitry Zubkov and Artem Skorohodko from Behind Blue Eyes, a Ukrainian charity who travel across liberated and frontline villages, giving out disposable film cameras to kids to document their daily lives. To reward the children for their artistic work, they raise donations for presents for the children. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Would you like to start just by introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about yourselves and your life in Ukraine? Hi there, thanks for having us today. My name is Artem, here is my partner Dima. Both of us are from Ukraine, from Kiev. Well, we are coming from the creative industry. Both of us are colleagues. We do brand marketing for an energy drink. And also we work at with brands, we develop brand activations, we create our own brands. Well, this is what we used to do <laughs> before full-scale invasion has rolled out currently. Most of our time, we invest into running uh, a charitable project called Behind Blue Eyes on my end and on Dima's end. And Dima has also his another brainchild called Backyard Camp, which is, which is a tactical camp for civilian defense. Could you tell us a little bit more about the first few months for you? How did you get involved in Behind Blue Eyes? What was the inspiration for that? I think this is a twofold sort of thing. So first of all, we were heavily engaged in the classic volunteer activity, let's say. So for the uh, first couple of months, we've been doing food supplies. We had a dark kitchen. Basically, Dima had a, a, a pizza place before before the full-scale invasion has rolled out. And uh, he had a fully operating kitchen. So once the whole thing started, we, we started cooking, basically. And we started supplying food uh, first for neighbors, then for local military people. And then we started supplying food outside of Kyiv when the situation allowed us. So it happened that in April, we started humanitarian trips to the freshly liberated Chernihiv area. This was the second region which was liberated after Kyiv. And we started like driving to local villages every weekend to supply food and different commodities, let's say gas, batteries, all kind of energy resources, Light. yeah, lighters and stuff. And uh, this is what we have been doing for like, I think, 11, uh, 12, 18 weeks. And on the other hand, we had a dilemma inside of us because we are creatives. We come from creative professions, creative industries. And we had these conversations with Dima a lot that we see our skills and profession obsolete, becoming obsolete. So people no longer need creatives. People need builders. People need fighters. People need hard skills. And uh, we have been afraid that our skills would not be necessary neither during the war nor afterwards, it, you know. And uh, this is what we had these hard feelings about this. And we, I think on the back of our heads, we always try to apply ourselves. So these two factors came in uh, together when we got really in touch with local kids in these villages that we have been visiting for a 
long period of time. And, you know, our creative aspirations started to flourish because these kids has, has inspired us to turn on our creative minds back again. How did they do that? And could you talk a little bit about these villages? What did you see when, when, you, when you went in? I don't know if, if Dima wants to come in on that as well. Do we want to comment about these villages? How did this look like? Uh, it looks so sad because these uh, villages occupied it, occupied three or two months, two, I think two months occupied. Many buildings to destruct. People's, uh, people not have uh, not water, not electric, not many, many options for life. Every time, every time uh, how we go to the villages, we see very sad pictures. But kids, kids inspired me and Artem makes many, makes many, many volunteer missions. Yeah, so sorry for my English. <laughs> Basically, basically, we saw rumble over there, and uh, I think I was not ready to see that much of a rumble. We saw a lot of wrecked military machinery. We saw every second house destroyed to the ground. So that was terrifying, and that was devastating. And uh, but what we're trying to say is that on the on on this background, kids, they remained kids. They, they, they did their casual kid stuff. So they've been playing ball around on this scenery. They punching the ball, shooting jokes about Putin. You know, this is one of their favorite things to do. They have like a myriad of these jokes. And they've been, actually, they've been acting like kids. They've been thinking childish stuff. They've been dreaming about, I don't know, things like going to the river or have some fun with their friends or, and it was quite like a huge contrast and we adults we've been focusing on a, on a, on pessimistic stuff i have i've been seeing rumble and i've been thinking this and that but kids they operated differently and uh, you know the kind of energy the drive they provided it really made us move forward and every time we left from this destroyed villages it was weird that we felt emotional uplift every time because they provided us with, with, with this kind of feelings. So what did they, you, you said that they inspired your, your sort of creative spirit. What did they inspire? What did you do then? So this was basically the moment uh, when we wanted to support this, their, their energy because they had a lot of energy and they had to spend it somewhere. And we just wanted to develop some activity for them. So, so they would be involved and engaged. They would have fun. And on the other hand, we would be, we would have the ability to fundraise, to provide them with something specifically for kids, because we've been, we've been providing kind of general stuff, but not kids oriented. So we wanted to do something directly for them because we really felt they deserve it. And, uh, yeah, we had this idea with cameras long before. I'm speaking of disposable film cameras. These are single use cameras with film. We wanted to apply it somewhere in our past life for brand activations. We had this idea. We actually wanted to execute it like right before the full scale invasion. But afterwards, you know, for obvious reasons, this didn't happen. And we call, I mean, kind of started thinking, okay, how can we apply this here? Uh, let's try to bring these cameras to the local village and uh, distribute it to people so they could, you know, picture the life, the real life, because we were one of the few who could, uh, who could see this, you know, who had the access to these villages because you needed to have a permission from the military. And we wanted to spread this kind of true uh, perspective across Ukraine. And then we thought, okay, if we give it to adults, perhaps they will, you know, kind of do the same pictures as I would do, you know, because we adults, we focus, we have the tendency to focus on the similar things. But these kids who, like I told, were operating like differently, these are different animals. I saw that it would be like amazing to give them this tool and to see their perspective because definitely it's something different. So this is basically what we did. It, it was another time 
we like I think it was visit number 12 or 15 to this village to this kids so we were like well familiar we were friends basically and we suggested them this activity do you want to try have you ever heard about this and Dimo always says that it's the technology of a disposable film camera is so old for them that it's basically new, you know, so they years, yeah. have never even imagined that you might have a device like this, which takes pictures and you couldn't see the image instantly. You, so you don't have any instant sort of gratification. So it was like a whole experience for them. And I think the point of engagement was the very fact that you don't see what you capture. And we taught them how to use it, just like basic stuff, where to push the button, how to roll the film, and that's it. So we never told them how to, you know, do photography as it is. And we left them with these cameras for two weeks. So they have been absolutely on their own, no intervention from adults, no intervention from us. So they've been just messing around with these cameras for this like period before we came back uh, next time again. Yeah. And what did, when you saw the pictures, when you developed them, what kind of photos were they taking? Well, I like to think about this day when I saw the developed film, because it's again a process. You take the pictures, the, the cameras, you develop, you wait for it. And I believe this was the best day ever for, for the past like 20 months, because I was so blown away by the pictures they have taken. They were like super different because we had uh, nine different nine different uh, heroes, so it was ver var varying from uh, from kid to kid. It was different for different ages because we had like a spread from seven years old to fifteen years old, and each kid focused on different stuff, and uh, they took a lot of pictures of what they love, basically. You know, so I would say I saw much less if i can say that so i saw less <laughs> rumble than i've been expecting to see you know there so they've been Le less uh, destroyed yeah. few destroyed things more few dis fewer yeah. fewer definitely fewer than i was expecting and they've been picturing flowers they've been picturing their pets they've been picturing their members of their family like grandmas mamas and so on still there has been like a lot of um, insight into destroyed stuff and um, they it, it was interesting it was interesting because they also they play around as a as a group so they have captured a lot of this interaction of a group how, how do they go and hang out on these playgrounds which are no longer the playgrounds we are used to see so it's a playground on the background of a destroyed church for instance and this is so crazy. This was so crazy to see again. This was exactly that sort of uh, contrast that I have witnessed in these villages. And it was perfectly transposed to the image. And it was so pristine. So that I was just like super excited about that. What did the children tell you about their experiences using the cameras? And also, what did you do with the photos after, af after you'd seen them? Uh, about the experience, uh, there is an interesting fact that... Uh, Actually, we find out, we figured that it has some therapeutical effect that during our conversation for all these weeks, they haven't been like super vocal about the traumatic experience of the war specifically. You know, we, you know, we spoke about this and that, but they never went too deep into what was their experience specifically. So they had, didn't will uh, to do that. But once they had these pictures in front of them, so we sat down with them, we, we brought the prints. And we went one by one with each kid uh, so he or she would tell us why did she take this photo, what's on this photo, and so on. And they appeared to be much more open to ex the kind of like some wolf which has let them speak about this experience. So they started from the picture and then they build on it and they start to talk. They start to talk, they start to reflect. They start to go into details, you know, and I, and I believe I'm not an expert, you know, in this. We are just guys who travel and give cameras. But I, I saw a great potential for them to release this sort of stress. This is first thing. So this is about the experience, more or less. And uh, what did we want to what did we want to do with this picture? So like I told uh, previously, we wanted to add some fundraising component to this. And straight after we see these images, we 
I mean, this, these were masterpieces, if you can say so, you know, so it definitely deserved attention. So our initial idea was to, um, was to launch an exhibition. So show the wider society what's going on, make an exhibition, raise funds. But I kind of saw it in Dima as well that uh, it has a greater potential. It has a potential to be a full-time project and we can build a platform where we would do this over and over again and we would we, we have the, the capability to show the situation and to speak to kids across the front line. So we started working on that and we like you know we invented this whole idea of a project and we developed a platform and we developed a brand behind it and we started running this. And yes, we did the exhibition and it was a it was a full house. I think we, we had like over a thousand people throughout the weekend in Kyiv. And uh, we basically managed to raise a lot of funds. And this led us to question, how do we want to spend this? So what do we want to acquire to these kids? Do we want to present each kid like some universal stuff, like a bike for everybody? Or do we want to build a playground for, the, for all of the kids who reside in this village? How do we want to approach it? And we, we've been puzzling for like a week or so what's the best approach, but the solution was simple yet brilliant, I believe. We just came over to them and asked, what do you want? So, and we ended up with little wish lists that they have been handwritten wish lists they left us. And I um, framed it through the birthday. So I asked, when do you have birthday? What did you get for birthday? Or what would you want to have for birthday? And they just like they did the list. I want this and this. I dream about this, dream about that. So we basically made... What kind of things are they, what kind of things are they asking for? Oh, all kinds of things. We start from, we can start from pets. We did chinchilla. We did cats. cats. We, we did dogs. We did parrots. Parrots? Wow. Parrots. Yeah. And all the way to the mm, motorcycles. But motorcycles, you know, like pit bikes is little. Oh, okay. Pit <laughs> bike. So it, it's like, you know, the array is crazy. Sometimes they ask for an, for experience, for instance, one, one, one kid wanted, he has, his dream was to visit the slides, the aqua park slides. And the, the kid has never been to slides and we did that. So we organized the travel, we bought him the tickets. So they went and they did slides. I think it's easier to say what do they, what are they not asking for and surprise for us, uh, these were computers. So, you know, computer is the least priority for them. I don't know, maybe this is the generational kind of stuff, but when I was a kid, for me, computer was a supreme sort of a thing you, you might want to have in your life, but it's not anymore. So definitely smartphones are top ranking than uh, bicycles, true. They really like bicycles in the villages. And uh, yeah, and then pets, I guess we do a lot of pets, really. <laughs> and it's, this is the, the fun, the, the, the most fun part to, to, to get pets down there. Did any of the children ask for things that you, you couldn't give them? I think these were mostly very expensive kind of things, like iPhone 15, for instance, let's say. So we don't go into that. Uh, we don't buy uh, luxury stuff. But it's, it's been like just maybe one time or something. Other than that, uh, we always manage to raise funds for everything they want. And uh, this is also a, an interesting point because uh, different kids, they have different wish lists and one kid might have uh, one uh, item in his wish list uh, and another kid might have uh, 15 items in his wish list. And this was also like a, a question for us. How do we approach it? Do we want to treat everybody equal or do we want to give kids everything they have been asked for and wouldn't it call some conflicts, you know, inside these little communities? But we ended up that we, we want to execute all this wish list in full because it also has some sort of educational effect to it if you go like super deep into this. And for all these children, how, how are they all doing now? Do you stay in touch? Do you hear about their lives now? Yeah, uh, a lot of them, we, we exchange contacts with them because we so far we did um, four uh, installments of our project. And one installment means that 
we do at least three visits to these villages. So first visit is a sort of uh, research and we get acquainted and we give out these cameras. Another visit is when we come back and we show the prints, we talk about their photography, their experience, and we have this in-depth connections. We go to their homes, we visit their, we, we see their parents, neighbors, all of, all of the stuff, and they introduce uh, us into their lifestyle and their routines. And the third visit is when we come back with all the presents, with all the rewards. So it takes like about 1.5 months, I think 1.5, two months each time. And we did four of these already. So, you know, during this period of time, we really get friends with these kids and we exchange contacts. And whenever our mission is done, you know, in particular village, it's always the case when they text us on messengers, send us some updates and try to talk with us. This is funny because kids are, they're not super developed verbally. So they make this attempt, but this conversation is sometimes like super kind of funny. But we really appreciate this and we, we always text back and try to share as much as we can. Yeah, that's about it. We are very in touch, really. And just a real final question from me, really, for, for you both, what's next? How, how do you keep all of this going when obviously we don't know the course of the war? We don't know what might change in the future. I think it, it all goes back to why do we do this? And we do this for two reasons. First of which is we try to preserve the kids capability to dream and look confidently into the future, despite the traumatic war experience they had. To exp- they had. So whatever course the war takes, is it going to last forever or it finish soon? Is there ways we want to try to provide some relief to kids? So we want to conduct this uh, activity onwards, definitely. But also during uh, our work, we, we have discovered that we also tackling another issue, which is creativity in the villages, because we travel to remote, we travel to remote villages in, in those southern and eastern regions, especially. And there is a huge issue on how is creativity perceived in, in, in this fostering system. So it's rather like a set of activities than a skills, than like a mindset. So we try, we really want with this, with this program we conduct, we really want kids to feel confident about their own talent and that their talent can pay off actually, because what is happening in our project, all this process from taking pictures to receiving the, their dreams from the wish list, this is legitimately earning all everything they have been dreaming of with their creativity so we try to show them that their creativity pays off and we try to show them that creativity is a very important skill of the contemporary times let's say and this leads us to becoming more of an educational platform in the in the future so we really want to elaborate on this topic and uh, create programs, I I guess it's going to be online programs because participants of our project, they are distributed across the front line. So it's really hard to collect them in one place. So I think we're going to develop into into this direction in the future. Artem and Dima, is there anything we've we've not spoken about that you think uh, is important to say or that you'd want our listeners to, to hear? I'd like your listeners to spend some time and uh, look through the amazing photography these kids are doing in Ukraine. And I want to make sure that this content is rather in- inspirational than brings any frustration. And I just want your listeners to know that I just want your listeners to know that these kids are beautiful and they really deserve your attention and your support. So. Please support the cause and uh, give us a follow. We would really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. 
We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.